What did you make of the week of the markets? So I was happy to see a continued broadening in markets. So we didn't see tech do well, but that's okay because there was more participation from a variety of sectors. Uh, so I think in general, this is a fairly healthy environment, but we should expect that it's not surprising if we get some kind of pullback. We've had a strong rally this year. There should be, uh, or there should likely be, a digestion period over the coming months. So a broadening of the markets, do you see that as well, Sarah? We actually at Bloomberg have a chart indicating the relationship between small caps and the S&P 500, suggesting there's a bigger divergence than there have been in 20 years. Are you seeing a broadening of the markets or not? Well, there's three reasons why the bulls beat the bears again this week. One is broader participation in the indexes. Second is inflation, which is continuing to moderate. And third, of course, is earnings season. So participation rate for everything outside of those top 10 technology stocks has been very strong since June 1st. That's a healthy sign for the markets. Moderating inflation with CPI and PPI coming in under, under expectations is another positive. But we are still concerned about wage inflation and core inflation, which remains above the Fed's target. And let's move to earnings. We came into this earnings season with a low bar, moderate estimate cuts coming in and expectations for negative year over year earnings growth. That set the bar low and is allowing these banks and other cyclicals to beat earnings. Now, the story is not the same with tech, where we came with, with high expectation for earnings. And a lot of those companies have shown that they couldn't quite meet that high hurdle. That's why we're seeing tech underperform and other areas of the market outperform. So, Sarah, we're still early on in the earnings season so far, so we'll have to find out what actually happens. But where are you on the S&P 500 by the end of the year? We still think there's upside. As long as employment markets remain strong and the consumers keep spending, and you tend to see that when people are comfortable with their jobs, they will keep spending money. I think the market still has upside if that's the case. Now, I do acknowledge 16 months of monetary tightening, including what we think is one more rate hike next week until, and then we're done with rate hikes uh, for a while. But all of that putting together, as long as we don't see a recession this year, which we doubt that we will, I think the market keeps climbing higher. Technology, I wouldn't count that out either. It has a lot of tailwinds like lower inflation, yields that are moderating, and artificial intelligence. I think tech stocks also will continue to move higher once they consolidate. David, I don't disagree with Sarah. Uh, I think after that digestion period that I talked about and the potential for a modest pullback, what we're likely to see is some improvement in the S&P 500 by year end. And I would argue that that is being fueled by what I will call a bumpy landing. I don't think it's a soft landing, but I don't think we go into any kind of significant broad-based recession. Um, we're also going to see history help us. What we know is that when the Fed stops hiking rates, typically in the one-year period, the two years uh, after the end of rate hikes, that is when we tend to see good performance, uh, strong returns usually from the S&P 500. I don't think this is going to be different this year, especially since this time around, this kind of downturn is a job full downturn. And so we see the consumer continuing to spend, as Sarah mentioned, um, because they have jobs and they can spend. And with inflation coming down, um, that also helps, helps with discretionary spending. So next week, obviously, Christina, we have the Fed decision. Uh, we all expect 25 basis points. But what about after that? What is the Fed looking at at this point? What data is it looking at? What, where is it pointing as of now? Well, if we think about the way Jay Powell tends to look at things, he breaks down inflation into three categories. He's got goods inflation. He's got core in, He's got a. Um, services inflation and he's got a housing. Um, services X housing is what he's focused on and in particular wage growth which is a very significant part of services inflation and so that is certainly higher. Um, it's not where we want to be wage growth um, but clearly it's coming down and I think he recognizes and hopefully most of the Fed recognizes that there is a significant lag to monetary policy. So what has been done thus far hasn't shown up yet in the inflation data or it hasn't largely shown up in the inflation data, um, nor has it shown up in the economic data either, which is why we do have to worry about the risk, however small, that there is a significant recession. Well, well but it may not have shown up in the data yet, Sarah, but I wonder if it's showing up in the strength of the dollar right now. That is to say, anticipation that the Fed may be getting close to being done, because we do see some weakening of the dollar, do we not? 
We do, and our view is that the dollar is likely flat to, to has downside from here, which is one of the reasons we like non-U.S. markets, particularly emerging markets. So if inflation continues the weekend and the Fed is one and done next week, I think the dollar has downside. We like emerging markets for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're further along in their, in their fight against inflation, and we want to be in the later innings of this battle. Secondarily, we think that China, which has struggled from here, will continue to add stimulus to their economy, and China could start to recover. These are both reasons why we think emerging markets could outperform from here. And of course, valuations are in their favor. And that brings me to where can we find value in markets that are up so significantly year to date? Not only emerging markets, but back to the U.S. where we still feel technology has upside. But look at other segments like small caps, where they're at one of the largest gaps uh, at a discount to, to large caps, and also dividend growers. These provide income and portfolio protection, usually during downside. They've underperformed significantly year to date because of a lot of technology technology companies don't pay or grow dividends. Christine, we'd love to have people like you and Sarah because you're experts in your own right, but you also talk to clients all the time. What are you hearing from clients about those opportunities Sarah is talking about to really participate right now in the marketplace? Well, I think clients certainly um, have some feelings of FOMO if they've been sitting on the sidelines. And I think that is, that, that is very much the case for a significant portion of clients. They got out. Um, they got spooked. Certainly the October lows uh, created some fallout. And, uh, and they haven't known when is a good time to get back in. There's some who are worried that we may retest our lows, which I don't believe will be the case. Um, so certainly they're starting to dip their toe in, be interested, um, and they're starting with some fixed income opportunities. Let's face it, all the pain we went through last year has created very abundant yields in a variety of areas of fixed income. Um, they're a little more skeptical about areas like emerging markets and just developed international equities like uh, European equities. But I do believe that the more we talk about the cases for them, and there really is a compelling case for Asia EM, uh, as well as a, a good case for European equities, I think they become more comfortable with that idea and start to dollar cost average in.